This is going to be a, the first in a series of short videos going over the basics of functional MRI. And I uh, hope everyone's doing well and getting settled in their new locations. Um, okay, so over the next few videos, each one I'm going to try and make like a manageable chunk. Um, we'll talk about the technology behind uh, magnetic resonance imaging how the signal itself is generated and collected, how that signal gets turned into images, and then how um, we use those images to examine the brain's physiological response to, to particular cognitive events. And then we're, what we're building up to is how to do certain uh, multivariate analysis techniques on the signal. and. Um, Thanks to Frank Tong for giving some of these intro slides that I've you know, sort of modified liberally. Okay, let's get into it. So the MRI scanner is a big, powerful magnet that can take pictures of the inside of your body without having to open up that body. So here's someone that's going to get um, uh, go into the, the center of the magnet called the bore. And how powerful a magnet, you might wonder, well, powerful enough to if you don't if you've got like ferromagnetic equipment in the hospital you gotta be real careful not to pull it into the same room as the um, as the scanner because it'll just pull that stuff right into the bore so um, here are some examples of you know, if we had not you know ferromagnetic wheelchairs and uh, hospital beds um, yeah it's the sort of thing where you have to have a, one of those wands, uh, metal detecting wands, to double check that nobody's got any metal on them before they go into the room. So uh, we'll talk about two ways in which the scanner gets used. So basic MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, gets used to take static images. So these would be anatomical scans, high resolution images, I'll show you one in a second, of the uh, structures of the brain. And then we have functional MRI, which is uses the same technology and the same techniques, but it's um, you change the scanning protocol such that it's now sensitive to blood flow in the brain. And we'll, we'll build up to how you do that with the scanner. Uh, but the, the logical chain is that we want to detect where the blood's flowing in the brain because that uh, blood flow response is sensitive to where there's neural activity going on, uh, which itself is related to the cognitive processes of interest to uh, psychology and neuroscience researchers. Uh, the common, you know, the thing at the heart of all of this is that the scanner uses radio frequency pulses to ring all the hydrogen atoms in your body like little bells, wee little bells, and, and then picks up on the, the ringing. Uh, and I'll break that down to, to make that uh, more sensible, hopefully. All right, so the history. Um, so magnetic resonance imaging, when it was first developed, was called nuclear magnetic resonance. And so Felix Bloch and Edward Purcell were two of the many scientists involved in um, developing this technology. So in around 1946, it was discovered that atomic nuclei, generally speaking, can absorb and then re-emit radio frequency energy. And this, this discovery led to Bloch and Purcell getting the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1952. So um, the, the name nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, nuclear, instead of meaning the radioactive sense, uh, refers to just the properties of the nuclei of atoms. Magnetic part just means that you need a strong magnetic field to get it to work. And resonance is this idea that there's an interaction, you know, the, the nuclei of the atoms uh, show this interaction when there's a magnetic field and these uh, radio frequency pulses uh, projected into the system. And at some point, this, uh, when the, the technology became more popular, it was sort of rebranded as... Um, MRI, so they took the, the nuclear part out and emphasized the magnetic resonance part probably to avoid just the, the negative connotations that people had with uh, just the word nuclear. Um, because basically there, there is no radiation involved, or that is to say no, like, uh, not the same kind of ionizing radiation that you'd get with uh, uh, 
atomic bomb. <laughs> All right, so anyway, what you need, you need a strong magnetic field. So the a three Tesla scanner is a standard strength for a scanner. They can go anywhere from 1.5 Tesla to 7 Tesla. Uh, there's even some higher strength fields, but a three Tesla already that's 60,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, which it strikes me as I don't know whether to be impressed by that or not, because if you really think of the Earth's magnetic field, uh, if you're like holding a compass, it's enough to kind of like pull the compass needle in a particular direction, but we wouldn't think of the Earth's magnetic field as being particularly strong. But, you know, 60,000 times stronger, you know, then it can pull that, um, pull that wheelchair right into the bore. Um, so when you put hydrogen atoms into a strong magnetic field like, like this, some proportion of them become aligned to the field. Uh, which and then if you send in if you pulse in uh, radio frequency uh, pulses at just the right frequency which we'll get to the Larmor frequency um, that allows the pulses to excite the hydrogen protons and as these protons um, become excited and then realign with the magnetic field they basically re-emit radio frequency waves that the um, the coil receives this there's this you know the coil um, outside of the bore receives like an antenna um, so in an anatomical MRI um, I was saying there's the functional and the anatomical uh, we're measuring the concentration of hydrogen protons in a particular area the signal is also sensitive to um, the mobility of those protons, like, for example, if they're f you know, floating as part of water or uh, embedded in fats. Um, and here are some nice examples provided by Frank Tong of uh, some anatomical scans and just how, you know, how pretty they can look with uh, just a nice levels of detail of all kinds of different brain structures. So let's see if we, like, so we have here in this sagittal view, the corpus callosum of the brain, the, the fiber pathways that connect the two hemispheres. We got the brain stem here, uh, the cerebellum. We've got uh, here's where the eyeball is. Uh, so we have a coronal view, and this is that same corpus callosum, and uh, you can see the two, uh, you know, the two lobes of the cerebral cortex. And here's a nice transverse slice with. Um, you know, white matter and gray matter, and here's the skull surrounding it. Um, uh, in contrast, functional MRI is tuned differently so that you can pick up what's called the bold response, the blood oxygen level dependent response. And this signal is sensitive to the uh, relative amount of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin, and we'll get to this in the, one of the next videos. Um, the idea is that um, when blood is oxygenated versus deoxygenated, we can detect that difference because the magnetic properties of the deoxyhemoglobin decrease the, the scanner signal. Uh, so here's like the, the, the functional scans, sagittal, coronal, and transverse. They're a little fuzzier looking than the um, anatomical scans, and that's just because they're designed to they're not designed to pick up the high-res structures. They're designed to pick up the, the blood flow and the, uh, that's, that's perfusing the, the brain. All right, so the logical chain is that we've got some cognitive process that's being uh, implemented by neural circuitry. There's an increase or decrease of neural activity. So an increase of neural activity in a particular brain region uh, causes an increase in blood flow to that region which causes an increase in venous and capillary oxygenation of that local tissue, which leads to an increase in the functional MRI signal. And the question is, okay, how do we detect that MRI signal? Um, so I think this is the last slide of this first chunk. Uh, the basic idea is we slide a person into that bore of the magnet and allow all of their protons, you know, some small proportion of their protons to become aligned with the magnetic field. The main magnetic field of the mag magnets referred to as B0. And so we've got these three axes here, an X, Y, and Z axis relative to where the person is in the scanner. And so the Z axis is following the axis of that big magnetic field of the scanner. So it's the one that's sort of 
you know, going from uh, head to foot of the person. And um, the X and Y axes that we'll talk about in upcoming chunks of this are called the transverse axes. Um, you can kind of see how how it all uh, you can these 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 pictures are just to give you a, a sense of what's going on in there uh, in terms of these three axes and how they relate to the position of the person inside the bore. Um, and so what we want to do is localize these signals, these brain signals, to particular spatial locations in a 3D space. Uh, the 3D space just like the space that the head is inside that bore. And um, this is basically done by carving up that space into um, what are called voxels, volume elements. So if you think of a computer screen or a TV screen, uh, often you hear of them uh, being made up of pixels. Uh, you know, little uh, squares that are the sort of smallest unit of resolution. Um, and pixel refer is uh, short for picture element, and so uh, we came up with voxels for volume element. And so it's instead of just having a, uh, a 2D array of uh, squares, we've got a 3D array of cubes uh, of those voxels that, that sort of break up the space inside the bore. And so the goal with this technology is to associate signals and, and changes in signals with particular voxels, with particular points in the 3D space inside the magnet bore. Uh, and so that's the last slide there, and we'll um, get to the next thing soon. All right, thank you.